please welcome Dr. Eric Topol. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, can you turn now? How about yes? Louder? Yes. Okay. Uh, we're rolling. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for joining uh, this session. We're going to be talking about the future of medicine and uh, not just about wireless medicine, but about all the different tools that we have now to really make it much more precise uh, and make it uh, better both for uh, patients uh, and for doctors and clinicians. So uh, one of the first things to point out is that we have truly entered the era of our economy in the U.S. as a true health economy. Uh, just uh, at the turn of last year in December, uh, it's noted now that the number one job source in this country are health jobs, which now is overtaken retail. And this is a big business, and in many respects, uh, we've had medicine hijacked by big business, uh, unfortunately. So this is a sobering aspect which we're trying to override. Um, with that tremendous investment of $3.5 trillion, over 18% of our GDP, over $11,000 per person per year in this country. We have no good outcomes relative to the rest of the world to show for it. And if you look at our life expectancy, or childhood mortality, infant mortality, uh, maternal mortality, we're among the worst of all uh, industrialized developed nations. So this is a serious uh, gap that needs to be closed. And Hopefully, we now have identified some of the ways to do that. One of the first things we know is that uh, medicine is so imprecise. So the screenings that people have routinely, such as mammography uh, and PSA, uh, they're represented here. You can't really see them. But I'm going to summarize them on the next slide. If these were drugs, they would never be approved by the FDA because the net harm so much overrides any potential benefit. So if you look at mammography, if you take prototypic women age 50 who go for every year for their mammogram on a faithful, a faithful basis, uh, it turns out that out of 10,000 such women, only five derive any benefit, whereas over 6,000 have harm with a false positive, at least one false positive. And that results in things like biopsies and all sorts of other therapies, including surgeries, unnecessarily. And the same case uh, is really the uh, story of PSAs for men. And these are the kinds of screenings that we do routinely in this country, uh, which are not the case uh, in most other countries. Now, also uh, is the problem with medications, that they're very imprecise. These are the top gross sale medications as of uh, two years ago, at least. And as it turns out, the red schematic people here are the non-responders to these very expensive drugs. And overall, for the top 10 drugs, two years ago, 75% have no clinical response. So you would think when you pay $100,000 for a drug, if it didn't work, you ought to get your money back, guaranteed to succeed. Why don't we have a system like that in this country? Uh, and, and by the way, we're the only country in the world that doesn't regulate the prices of drugs. You can imagine why. We can talk about that more later, if you like. So back uh, in July, I had written a, a Saturday essay um, that it, Wall Street Journal invited me to put in about if you're interested in much more detail that I'm going to get into uh, and much more recent than uh, my last book about we need to be much smarter because it isn't about Obamacare or Trump care. The biggest lesion we have is the ridiculous expense of our health care uh, resources, whether it's a hospitalization that costs nearly $5,000 a charge per night or whether it's these drugs or anything in medicine is ridiculously expensive in this country uh, versus uh, anywhere else in the world. So this uh, turnaround, I think, is predicated on the ability to understand each human being as being truly unique, this individualized medicine principle. It was actually introduced back in 1969 with this, uh, with this writing uh, about the patient, in fact, has to be understood as a unique human being, and that was the, the beginning of a ter term that's bantered, bantied about quite a bit now called patient-centered medicine. Unfortunately today, it couldn't be less centered, so that term is being used erroneously. Um, now, the point today is the data about each human being 
medically is the most valuable resource there is uh, over uh, that of gold or oil because of all data that's out there, uh, if you, your personal data, if it's hacked or stolen, is only one-fifth the value of your medical data. So that's why it's become such an incredible uh, target, alluring cyber thieves uh, and hackers. And so we now have this ability to understand each human being, which I'll get into, and that leads not only to the ability to digitize human beings, if you will, the medical essence, but secondly, we can use this portable data to democratize medicine, giving each person, each individual, much more charge of their care, much more involvement and engagement. And then finally, we have this whole um, use of artificial intelligence to supplement uh, and uh, accommodate this massive data inflow uh, to work with it to help both consumers and uh, clinicians. So there is a Google medical map equivalent so just like you think about a Google map of having a, a street view and a traffic view and a satellite view and all these different views, we have different views of a human being. And all these can be obtained on any given individual. So whether it's the external features or the anatomy through scans or the physiology through sensors or all the different biologic layers, DNA and protein and RNA and metabolites, the microbiome, and then even the exposome, our environment. We can define all this and quantify and digitize it. We couldn't do that just a few years ago. So that's really the big uh, change in our ability to understand each human being. And when we do that, okay, a DNA sequence you only need to do once. That will hold uh, throughout one's lifetime. But many of these other biologic layers uh, and physiologic layers change over time. And so at at 10 different time points, as represented on this uh, graph from a review paper I had, uh, you can see the different um, uh, assessment of a person. So even prenatal, all the way through a lifespan. In fact, when I published this article, I called it from pre-womb to tomb. And then an old mentor of mine uh, corrected me, and she said, he said, Eric, you have it all wrong. You should have called it from lust to dust. Um, <laughs> Yeah, he was right. That would have been a more catchy title. Um, now, this genomic story, uh, because we're going to tackle that quickly first and then get to more familiar uh, zone, which is smartphones. But the genomic story is just as important, uh, in, in fact. And that is, we can now, uh, a sick newborn, instead of waiting three weeks for the heel stick blood work to come back, and the baby with a metabolic disorder like galactosemia uh, or phenylketonuria to have permanent brain damage while waiting for the heel stick blood work to come back, a sequence of the baby can be done, a whole genome sequence within 24 hours to nail down the diagnosis. Indeed, a lot of newborns' lives have been saved, no less their, their, um, their brain and other vital tissue. But sequencing applies to children with various uh, um, uh, conditions like epilepsy, uh, unknown conditions throughout uh, one's life, especially in childhood and, and young adults. The ability to sequence the blood and when someone comes in with a serious infection, instead of, instead of waiting for two or three days for cultures to come back, so within minutes or a couple of hours to be able to diagnose specifically what, it is, what is the infection from sequencing a, a, of a tube of blood. Uh, cancer is a genomic disease. We'll talk about that in just a second. And uh, throughout one's life, genomics plays an increasingly important role. Unfortunately, today, most of that knowledge is in research papers, and it hasn't been translated to the daily practice of medicine because most doctors are uncomfortable with genomics. And that's really sad because it's rich, and it could really be transformative. So in cancer, that's where most uh, genomics shows up today, and it's still minimal in terms of every single person's cancer is unique. There's not one that can we can sequence one person's cancer, it will be different from the next. So today we now have the ability to track a tumor in a person through a tube of blood. In fact, we don't even really need to do a biopsy of the organ. And in fact, that tube of blood might actually be more valuable because the organ, you're just getting one site of a biopsy, whereas the blood is really the admixture of what's going on with that particular cancer process. 
This is really quite remarkable because sparing uh, tumor biopsy, uh, which is a big ordeal and has its own complications, no less expense. Now, what's particularly exciting about this is last week there was a paper in Science, one of the top few biomedical journals, and it was from the Hopkins group, which showed that they could diagnose eight different common cancers through a tube of blood, uh, and this was compared to healthy controls. And this is the segue to diagnosing cancer in healthy people uh, without uh, having to wait until it's much further along in its, in its uh, development. So this is something that is inexpensive, costs less than $500 to do, which is far less than um, any drugs for cancer today, no less biopsies and other procedures. Now, the other big thing I wanted to mention about genomics before we move on is that gene therapy and genome editing is one of the hottest uh, areas in medicine today because now, for the first time, we have an FDA-approved gene therapy for a rare eye uh, genetic disease, and many more in the pipeline. And so genome editing is so powerful that we can cure diseases, which up until now we had no uh, treatments, no less uh, cures. That list uh, includes all these clinical trials and things like hemophilia, uh, A and B, sickle cell anemia, thalassemia, and the list goes on and on. So these classic uh, genetic disorders now have a cure in sight, which is really quite exciting and is really the prototype of individualized medicine from the standpoint of a, a treatment that is specific for that person. Now let's switch to the smartphone sensor world, which uh, uh, is really, I think, uh, the thing that is the here and now, because you can already do a lot of these things today. If, it, it, the biggest problem is people aren't aware of the possibilities. Every part of the body, including even the mind, can be tracked with sensors, their state of mind. And uh, that includes things like sleep apnea, uh, and of course hypertension, heart arrhythmias, and all sorts of things. So one of the uh, earliest ones, besides glucose monitoring, which for diabetics has been around for years, one of the earliest ones uh, to come on board uh, about five years ago was the ability to do a cardiogram through your smartphone. And I already talked to one physician here who has this, but. It's just a little thing like this where you actually can uh, pull up an app and um, you then put your thumbs on the sensor and uh, you have a cardiogram. Let's see if I can show you that right now. And uh, I don't know if you can see it. In a second, it'll get pretty cleaned up. And uh, it's always good to make sure that I'm in sinus rhythm. Um, it's little, there we go. So that's uh, very easy to do right now. And not only is it easy to get a cardiogram, but it immediately will give you the reading. So, and it's quite accurate. So it's a whole lot better than going to the emergency room when you think you may be having arrhythmia, particularly if you have a history of heart rhythm disorders. Um, but it's much bigger than that now. The latest advance was uh, November 30th, the FDA approved this watch, not the Apple Watch uh, 2 or 3, that's already was out, but it's a band that replaces the band that comes with the Apple Watch, and it has a little thing on it to record your cardiogram. The same thing I just showed you, but through the band. And so what's great about this is it does deep learning, artificial intelligence about you, your heart rate when you're at rest or when you're doing physical activity through its accelerometers. And so then it learns from you what is off the track. And when it's off the track, it tells you to record a lecture cardiogram. So you just put your thumb on this little metal piece, uh, and then you have a cardiogram. And it's also read the same way. So what's nice about this is it's on you all the time, and so you can, and it's monitoring you all the time if you have a history of heart problems with your electrical problems, uh, or if you have had passing out spells, or a lot of dizziness and lightheadedness, this can be very helpful. Now, I mentioned glucose. These glucose sensors are getting much uh, more practical because you can look at your watch and get your glucose now, or your phone, these glucose glances, if you will, and it really has a big effect on what you eat. When you are looking at your glucose, even if you don't have diabetes, 
and you see after you eat something 30 minutes later, your glucoses are going off the chart. You learn what foods are right for you and what, is, what aren't and what physical activity does for you, what things like having a cold does to your glucose regulation. So it's really quite instructive. And uh, these glucose, uh, th this is uh, the, uh, the, the blood pressure watch, which is just uh, FDA approved by Omron. It's not yet out, but it was shown at the Consumer Electronics Show uh, uh, earlier this month in Las Vegas. So this is a great watch because you press start and you get an accurate blood pressure. And why is that useful? But many of you have a home blood pressure device. But that's the problem is at home and it usually collects a lot of dust. You don't, you don't check your blood pressure that often. When it's on your wrist and you're in the middle of a traffic jam or you're having a heated argument with your spouse, you just press start and you see what it's doing to your blood pressure. And it's quite extraordinary. You learn about what it's like in the heat of the moment, which is when we're interested in your blood pressure, not when you go to the doctor's office, which is a contrived setting. I mean, it's meaningless versus in your real world, right? So this is going to also be the segue to having your blood pressure monitored continuously during the night, which is especially a dark zone that we don't even know how people's blood pressure behaves uh, during the night. And now I'm getting a call. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> check your blood pressure. Uh, okay. The device that I'm most enamored uh, about, and it's not yet ready for consumers, but you know, someday it will be with, with AI uh, uh, combined. And that is the smartphone ultrasound. And here you take a probe and you combine it with a smartphone and you can image any part of the body except the brain because the, you can't image ultrasound through the skull. But any other part of the body you can get exquisite images equivalent to that of the $350,000 machine that sits in the ultrasound laboratory through a smartphone. So um, this is what it looks like. It's a probe that you connect to an Android or now uh, the latest one can even connect to an Apple uh, iPhone. And if you can see this, um, what it is is a picture of the heart. And this is a typical picture. So within a few seconds of putting it, within a second of putting it on the chest with a little uh, gel, you have to have a little gel, put that on the probe, you get these incredible pictures of a person's heart. So as a cardiologist, I no longer listen to people's hearts. That's passe obsolete. Why would I listen to Lub Dub when I can see everything? And not only see everything, but I can show it to the person live. So what's great about this is you see the thickness of the heart muscle, you see how strong it is, you see each chamber size, you see the valves. It's exquisite. And I uh, hope you can appreciate that. And now you can also see if the valve is leaking, color flow of the blood. So this is really uh, a pretty extraordinary development, and it's not just for the heart. So when I got this device, I was so uh, excited about it, I decided I would do a total body medical selfie. And um, <laughs> so what I did was I started with my uh, uh, carotid arteries and my sinuses and my thyroid gland, and I went all the way uh, across the body with the lungs and the heart, uh, the uh, liver and the gallbladder, the spleen, you know, uh, uh, everything, aorta, uh, all the way down uh, to my uh, left foot. Where's that? Now, um, that was fun, but then it became uh, actually a uh, reality months later, uh, this past uh, spring, when I developed some abdominal pain and I wasn't sure what it was, so I imaged my left kidney where the discomfort I thought might have been and I had a dilated kidney. So I said, oh, I got to have, I have a kidney stone. So I went to the emergency room and I told the doctor I have a dilated kidney on my smartphone. And he looked at me like, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Right. Anyway, uh, then I was sent for a CAT scan. That's what you get when you go to the emergency room. You get all kinds of unnecessary tests. And that was $2,500. Um, and I, I, it, it was completely replicated by what I already had on the smartphone. The images were superimposable. And uh, fortunately, I was able to pass these three stones uh, without having to ha go through surgery. But the whole diagnosis could have been made through a smartphone. Um, let's give you an example. 
I'm trying to give you a sense that the smartphone is getting medicalized quickly. And the things that you can do are going to be amazing over time. Besides, I think you know, you could, you could um, talk to a doctor through various telemedicine services right now immediately instead of having to wait for an appointment. How long does it take to get a primary care doctor appointment in the United States today? Well, it's 3.1 weeks average, eight weeks in Boston, uh, which is the worst in the country right now. And then when you get to the doctor's office, what is the time duration average of waiting? Yeah, 61 minutes, a long time. Your time is valuable too. So uh, we can do that now right through the smartphone. In fact, there's one app uh, very popular in Southern and actually throughout California now called the Heal app one of eight different apps that you can summon a doctor to come to your home. And uh, this app is uh, backed by Lionel Richie, of all people. So when I contacted Lionel and I said, well, why didn't you call it all night long? Um, he, but he said, doc, it's all day long too. Um, so that gets me to democratization because we are in an era uh, which is I want what I want when I want it. Your, power, your phone is so powerful from task rabbits to having you know, food delivered to your house, whatever it is, why not have medicine also delivered? You are getting more power than ever before. So this video uh, captures that, uh, that whole attitude change. Miss Kelly, the doctor will see you now. Uh, can you let the doctor know that I'll be with him shortly? Huh? I am getting a lot of work done. Your Wi-Fi is very fast. But he's ready for you now. I'll be with him as soon as I can. Is she ready? Not yet. But you're next. This is the flip. And uh, I don't know if you've read The Patient Will See You Now, but that's the story of the book, you know, the flip. Because you're getting increasing power and you need to not be the Rodney Dangerfields of not getting any respect uh, in the future. This is the end of paternalism, the end of uh, the, the doctor seen as some type of superior being. So that also goes with this point, which is it's your medical data. How many people here have all their data from the time they were born, every lab test, every scan, every office note uh, that they have? No one. No one in the United States has that data. No one. But in other countries, everyone has that data. Everyone. But this country, because of all sorts of issues and all these different companies like Epic and Cerner and many others, about 50 of them, no one has their data. It should be yours. So, uh, if you're on Twitter, I put down these 27 points about why it should be your data. And I'm not gonna go through all of them, but just to point out, I think you know, is you are the rightful owner. Even though only in the state of New Hampshire, in this country, are people legally the owner of their medical data. And the people of New Hampshire don't even know that. But the point is, it's you paid for this. These are all things you paid for. It's your body, and you don't have your data. And you have to go to these cockamamie portals to try to get to your data. And even that's not uh, at all comprehensive and very clunky. The point is, we need a revolution to get people to have their data in this country. Someday, this is going to happen. It's not there yet, but... Um, Yes, just yesterday, Apple announced that they're going to start in 12 health systems to get people data on their iPhone. That, to me, is not owning your data. So that's what we need to get to. Uh, the problem we have is when data are sitting on, on server farms, they get hacked and stolen. And this is precious data. Its privacy is so uh, uh, paramount here. So what we have to do is prevent one third of Americans have had their data hacked or stolen in the past year. And many of you have had this and you don't even know it. 
so this is a big problem. And we've written extensively about this, uh, including op-eds op in the New York Times and many other leading journals. We yet have seen any major substantive change to achieve this civil right. This should be a civil right for all citizens of this country. Now, getting to the national level is a big research program, which you probably haven't heard of, that we are uh, spearheading uh, along with a few other key medical centers in this country. And that's called the Precision Medicine Initiative. It was initially announced by uh, then President Obama in the State of the Union Address in 2015. It's now enrolling a million Americans of all ages, all uh, ancestries, all uh, types of dem de demographics. And this uh, program has just 12,000 of the million people. On May 6th of this year will be a national launch, so you'll uh, be certainly uh, invited if you're at all interested to participate. If you're part of this, you will get sensors like the blood pressure watch and many of the other things that we've talked about. You will get sequenced, all sorts of things that you opt in for. You don't have to do these things, but if you want to. And the whole idea is to push forward this precision or individualized medicine era. So is anybody enrolled in this here? Has anybody heard of it, all of us? all of us research program, but it's, it's part of the so-called, it is the Precision Medicine Initiative, but that's the name of it. You'll see a lot more about this in the next few months. Scripps Research, where I work, is uh, in charge of the Participant Center. The Mayo Clinic is where the Biobank is, and uh, the um, Vanderbilt is the Data Analytics Center. We are working with lots of different partners. So for example, you'll be able to enroll by going into a Walgreens uh, clinic, uh, and many other places throughout the country. It's set up for convenience. And it's only one visit. The rest of the, the, rest of the time over the years ahead, a follow-up is through uh, smartphone uh, and web-based electronic type follow-up. We have a lot of great partners and we're really proud to be uh, a big uh, force in this uh, program. Now, the last thing I'm gonna to touch on and open up to your questions is about deep learning, which is the subtype of artificial intelligence. And this is really having, it's going to have a very big impact in medicine. Um, it basically, it's these so-called neural networks, so we're going neural. These were supposed to imitate the brain and how the, brain, the human brain works, but they don't really have much to do with the brain, but they're still called neural networks. Um, there was a paper five years ago that ushered in this field. And uh, basically what it showed was there's this massive data bank called ImageNet of 15 million uh, images, each with a thousand different labels. And when a uh, machine could read these images more accurately than humans, that's when we knew that this whole movement of AI and deep learning was on. And it basically was uh, four things that came together very rapidly and now it's in its heyday. Uh, one is this big, these big data sets, labeled big data, so-called ground truths uh, that, that of labels. Second is there were, interestingly, the gaming world, video games, they have uh, advanced uh, uh, processing units called graphic processing unit GPUs. And it was companies like uh, NVIDIA that really ushered in this whole deep learning uh, field. Then the cloud computing, which of course uh, was essential. And then finally, these different open source modules to set up deep learning neural networks. So just to give you a few quick examples before we wrap up, uh, one is that if you have a child with a, a possible congenital disease, a, a large proportion of these can be diagnosed through an app, facial recognition app. And almost all geneticists around the world use this app to diagnose, uh, and these are conditions that are often very rare and difficult to diagnose. Uh, we can read electrocardiograms for heart rhythm more accurately with machines than through cardiologists. Uh, we can see the retinal images of people with diabetes and define them more accurately with machine algorithms than, with, than by ophthalmologists. And the, perhaps the most convincing all of all to date has been 21 board-certified dermatologists at Stanford reading, looking at skin lesions for cancer 
and diagnosing what type of cancer. And that was done more accurately through machine algorithms than by the board certified dermatologists. So you can see where this is going. It's a lot about pattern recognition. And remember, machines don't uh, get tired. They don't get distracted. They don't have a bad day. They don't take vacations. They're cheap, relatively, algorithms. They do get sick like humans. Of course, everyone knows that. Uh, but uh, it's a whole different world when you're using machines as a partner, as an apprentice, as a booster function for doctors. Last thing is about how it could affect your diet. This is a fascinating group of studies, series of studies from the Wiseman Institute in Israel, a very respected uh, biomedical institute. And they have a book that just came out called The Personalized Diet, if you want to get into the depth of this topic. The whole idea is that when we eat something, each of us has a unique response. It's all part of this individualized theme of everything I've been talking about. So if we ate the exact same food, the exact same amount of food, our glucose would vary uniquely by individual. And that's the case with every food and every person. So what they did in this uh, work, which is classic now, uh, was to take 2,000 people, give them prepared foods, the exact same foods, uh, collect their microbiome, their gut, and analyze the bacteria in it, get their glucose every five minutes throughout two weeks, and then define this unique responsiveness. And a lot of it, interestingly, is driven by your gut microbiome, which no one really knew before. Um, so, uh, by the way, the company editorial was, Siri, what should I eat? Um, you know, so that may not be Siri, it may be Alexa. I'm interested, how many people here have an Alexa device in their home? Oh my God, that's incredible, really, wow. Okay, well, uh, that shows um, where the whole field is heading to voice platforms, and uh, it makes a lot of sense without the, the hassle of uh, apps and passwords, and also, of course, the natural, fast ability uh, to, uh, to get uh, messages across. Now, I did this for two weeks, and it was a pain in the neck. That is, I had a, in the smartphone enter everything I uh, did, the exercise, uh, and the medicines I took, um, you know, sleep. But I did it for two weeks, of course, with, you know, um, glucoses every five minutes and uh, with my gut microbiome. But what's fascinating is getting the output. So now, all these different foods that you can, even the ones that they sent me for recommendations, A to D uh, ratings for me, but also uh, the fact that I can search any food and get the answer for me. And unless my microbiome changes, which doesn't change unless you take antibiotics or some very significant um, uh, impact, uh, it's hard to change that in any major way, that's your food story uh, throughout your life. So this is really interesting, and if you're interested further, you can certainly read more about it. Now, you probably have followed the amazing amount of hype about driverless cars, to the point you're expecting any moment, the next time you use Uber, that you may even have a driverless car show up. But you know what? That's never going to happen, especially on a, a rainy day, which I know that wouldn't happen here too often, but uh, you know, ver various conditions what's so-called level five of the uh, Society of Automotive Engineers. Level five means no human possible backup under all conditions. That will never be achieved. That's by the experts of driverless cars. There will be potentially level four, uh, which is still very minimal human backup. But can you imagine medicine without human backup? That's never gonna happen either. Uh, so in fact, I, I don't think in medicine, will ever get past this so-called level three, that we still, despite we'll have these uh, artificial intelligence tools to help doctors and to help consumers, as I just showed you for diet as an example, it's never gonna replace the critical uh, aspect of this human to human bond, namely the patient-doctor relationship. But that relationship is in danger today. And at the University of Alabama, they asked all their patients just give us the two or three words that summarize your experience with your doctor. And you can see what the words were. And they are not very pretty. And that's the problem with medicine today. It's a big business. Doctors and patients are rushed. 
and uh, it's not acceptable. And that has to change. So, um, excuse me, my hope is that we will not just have this deep learning about people and deep phenotyping, that is understanding each individual at a much deeper level, but the biggest deficiency of all in medicine is to restore to the days uh, around when we were born, in the 50s and the 60s, or the, even the 40s. And uh, that is about uh, this deep empathy. There used to be that in medicine, and we need to get back to that. And my hope is that we can use this gift of time that AI can provide to us to get us uh, back to that. So let me stop there and uh, answer all the questions that you have. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. No. Yeah, so behavioral health is the essential missing link. And the reason I say that is um, a lot of people thought that if you just give people feedback about themselves, like giving them their blood pressure or their glucoses, that would immediately change behavior. It doesn't necessarily do that, not nearly as much as we expected. So we need more than that, whether it's incentives, could be financial incentives or others. It could be competitions, managed competitions, if you will. It could be gaming or making it fun. But behavioral, the, the, the nudge that uh, is really um, Richard Thaler and the book that, and his work that uh, led to the Nobel Prize in economics this past year. There's a lot of going on in the behavioral science world right now because we need to, lifestyle is the final common pathway, and you can't get people to change their lifestyle so easily. Most people, unfortunately, have a poor lifestyle, and that has a very important interaction with genetics. We know that people, for example, for, with heart disease genes, if they change their lifestyle to a healthy one, with exercise and being thin and having the right kind of nutrients in their diet, they can shift their risk to almost without heart disease uh, genetics. So that's essential, but much more work has to be done. Yes? So I've been involved in health care business forever. Um, Me too. <laughs> um, and I'm involved in a company now, CareSpan, um, and what we are is uh, electronic doctor. Um, so it is like Right. So even beginning in software to handle that is a problem. But also it's, it's education of doctors. It's a change of how we, it, it may be rev a revolution in how things happen. So how do you get there? Yeah, so the question here is um, there's been a tremendous amount of investment in this country in recent years to push electronic records, $40 billion, by the way and it hasn't really changed things. Yes, their electronic records are being used, but it's actually promoted burnout among doctors because they spend two hours on records for every hour they spend with a patient. That's how bad these software uh, uh, packages are. Not only that, but y you have to train for over 20 hours just to use it. Yeah. Can you imagine an out, a software package you have to train 20 hours to use as a doctor? So it is pathetic. And this country, again, is an outlier it's really a governmental problem because it has never had the teeth to say we need exactly the same standards across all. We're going to break down the proprietary walls between one vendor and the next, which, you know, the amount it costs to have these systems imported into hospitals and clinics is absurd. Uh, so one of our biggest problems on this, uh, besides the fact that it's leading to tremendous burnout and dissatisfaction, and by the way, when you go to see a doctor, and you don't, they don't even look at you because they're typing the whole time. That's, and you waited three weeks for the appointment and another hour when you got there, that's really pathetic. Uh, so that, unfortunately, is not the case in many other countries because they have decided that it's not about productivity uh, that is pushing people through like, uh, like cattle for their health care, but rather uh, they prioritize the, the the, the bond and the, and the exchange, and they also have regulated the software 
that is all for all people in that country. And uh, by the way, other countries don't have the hacking problem of medical records like we do. And that's, again, the, uh, uh, a really sad situation. Yes? Oh, okay. And you next. <laughs> all right. Yes. Is it protected at the point of testing, and is it interstitial? Um, but it's not interstitial like the CCM, but is it what a what a doctor would need to do? Right. Is it ready? Yeah. Like that? Right. So the question here is about what is the state of our glucose sensors? And they are at a point where they don't even need factory calibration. No finger sticks are needed anymore. Uh, the only time you might resort to a finger stick if it really seemed that it wasn't right. But uh, most of the time, the continuous sensor going to the watch or the, f or the smartphone screen is more accurate than the finger stick, which had a lot of wiggle, you know, 15% up or down. So no, glucose sensors have come a long way just in the last couple of years, and both uh, Abbott and Dexcom are companies that have, and Medtronic, that have these. Uh, so um, that, that's a, a bonus. We want to see finger sticks be eliminated, and uh, that will eventually be the case because it'll be cheaper to have continuous glucose than it would be to do finger sticks. And finger sticks are not exactly without pain or without issues about public uh, um, performance and everything else. Uh, we get this fellow back there, yes. Thank you. Yes. No, it went through clinical trials. It got approved by the FDA, but they haven't yet released it commercially. Uh, they showed it, <laughs> uh, but they're going to release it, they tell me, uh, this spring. They're making lots of them. You may know that Omron, probably a lot of you have Omron blood pressure cuffs at home. It's the leading consumer device, so it's a trusted brand, if you will. And we've been testing them. And we're giving them out as part of that precision medicine, all of us, to the people. Some of the, not everyone's going to sign up and not everyone will get one, but that's one of the things we're going to test further. So the thing about clinical trials that you bring up, you can never get enough data, especially for the most common chronic condition of man, which is high blood pressure. So um, that's why we're going to continue to do trials. Sure. Uh, let me take, yes, go ahead, and then we'll get you next. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Got it. Got it. Okay. Two very important questions. First one was, uh, how are we going to get the prices an under uh, wrap? And the fr that it, that's easy if we had uh, a government that was not so much affected by lobbying groups, okay? So, for example, uh, why is the United States the only country in the world that doesn't regulate prices of drugs? The only country. Uh, why <laughs> why uh, do we have drugs that cost $100,000, $200,000, $500,000 $500, for a treatment and it is not a money-back guarantee. So that's just an example. It's absurd. Now, the other thing you, wrote, you pointed out is you get this uh, app. It gives you your data, and you don't want to just send that to the doctor because if you send it to the doctor, as you say, th that's just flooding with data. You want the answer, right? That's what the algorithm does. It gives you the answer. Uh, and it, it will, at some times, it will say your cardiogram is normal or your glucose is this, or once there is a virtual medical coach, it'll give you guidance to prevent a condition. But it, you'll, the reason to contact the doctor is you need some oversight. 
So you, it wouldn't be for the data, the raw data interpretation. That's what's going to decompress doctors and make you more powerful because you have machine support that's validated, of course, through rigorous studies, okay? No, no, this is dumbed down for anyone. I can assure you that. When it says normal, you don't have to be a genius or even a stable, very stable genius. All you have to be is a normal human being who can read normal. Yes. Uh, sorry. Just, just to answer that a little bit, there are, it doesn't go necessarily directly to a doctor. Nurse practitioners are handling Oh, but sure. All kinds of other people that are electronically smart are handling the data. They only give the doctor. Right, but all, all I'm suggesting is all those, all those nurse assistants, clinicians, physicians assistants, algorithms are going to take over a lot of that charge. You'll see that over the years ahead. Yes? Concerning diabetes, yes. if you were offered a Dexcon insert under the skin, how does that tie into your feature to the watch? Yeah, so the way it works today, the question is about the glucose sensors like Dexcom or the Libra, Abbott, Medtronic. You pop the sensor on your abdomen or your arm, it takes a second, and then that is a tiny thread needle that goes just underneath the skin. And that goes to that interstitial fluid that captures the glucose information. That sensor is relayed to your phone and your watch. So it's a, it's a, it's a very accurate measurement. And it turns out it's at least as good, if not better, than the drop a little blood from your finger. Uh, yes? Hearing loss? <laughs> okay, hearing loss is a very exciting field. It doesn't get enough attention. Um, as it turns out, we now know what is the cause of it. It's these hair cells that lose their function, and especially, of course, with age. Uh, there's been recently some work with gene therapy that you can actually inject uh, a therapy that would fix these, the genes in the hair cells uh, whether that's going to ever become a true way to restore hearing in people, we'll have to see. But uh, there are a lot of studies that look uh, interesting. But lots of different apps that can help hearing today that you can uh, use with your smartphone that are better than going right to a hearing aid, for example. So I would recommend trying that. And now we're, we're done with time. So thanks very much for coming. Thank you.